Good morning. This is John Coates here in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. This is August 14th, 2000, and this morning we're pleased to have with us Matthias Leupold, and they call you Matt, I understand? That's correct. That's your nickname. May I ask you how old you are, Matt? I'll be 76 next month. And, and your current address? In Wayland. Marital status? Married. And do you have children? I have three sons. And how about grandchildren? And three grandchildren. Two twins, Matthew and Michael, and a little girl. They have a little sister named Karen Elizabeth. They live here in Natick on Hartford Street. Very good. You've got quite a family there. So, Where were you born, Matt? I was born in Jamaica, New York. Out on Long Island? On Long Island, in Queens. And were you raised out there? I was raised there. And how did you come to be in this Particular area. I came to, I graduated from high school and came and started MIT in September of 1942. High school was in Jamaica? Was that no, it? No, it was in Forest Hills. Oh, Forest Hills. You moved down closer to the city? No, I commuted from Jamaica to Forest okay. Hills. Okay. And in September of 42, you went, started at started MIT? MIT, yeah. Okay. And what was your family background? Can you tell us about that? Well, it was middle class. My father was in business, in the export business, with a boyhood friend of his, and both had emigrated from Germany to the U.S. Both of my parents were born in Germany. And what did your dad do? It was the export business, and they sold, they were ship brokers. They're the ones that uh, brokered ship space to people who had goods that they wanted to send, and a lot of the business was in with South America. So they sent trucks to South America and okay. heavy equipment, things like that. What part of Germany were they from? Bavaria. My mother was born in Augsburg, and my father was born in Jettingen, which is a small town between Augsburg and, and Ulm. So Augsburg, um, Jettingen has a distinction in modern times of having something like 4,000 inhabitants and three breweries, so, you know, they have their <laughs> priorities right. <laughs> Getting is also the home, the, the home of the uh, Stauffenberg family. Now, Count Stauffenberg was one of the ones that uh, was in that unsuccessful attempt to assassinate Hitler, and he was nailed and, and he was executed himself for that. The, uh, the family, I had been in Germany in, in recent years, and the family has reconstituted itself, so they're getting and is quite proud of the Stauffenbergs and, and that story. That's a very interesting story. Um, at MIT, um, in, in September of 42, there was a war on in the United States. Um, what were your plans? What were you studying at MIT? I wasn't sure. I thought I was going to study, I thought I was going to study either aeronautical engineering or mechanical engineering. But as a freshman, we were all exposed to the same curriculum. And we also had to take uh, ROTC training, which was called Military Science and Tactics. So uh, we were issued uniforms and we had to had to participate in, in the drills and everything that went with, with that, so. When you came up to Cambridge, was that uh, your first exposure to New England? No. Uh, if, if, as a family, we had been coming, going to Maine for the last several years in that decade, starting with perhaps 39, so 39, 40, 41, 42. We had gone to Mousam Lake in uh, Shapley, which is near Sanford in southern Maine. So I had been through Boston and in New, in New England those two times. So. In the, uh, but, excuse me, I interrupted but you. Coming to Boston was still, you know, kind of a new experience. I mean, I had been in the city one, once or twice while I was applying to MIT, but, you know, coming to Boston to live here was distinctly different from living, you know, in greater New York. 
In September of uh, 42, when you were at school, obviously uh, there was some thought in your mind that you might be drawn into the war, um, men around you and, and women. Uh, did you guys discuss this or talk about this, your classmates? I, w I was living in a fraternity house, and some of the, uh, some of the seniors were were in the ROTC and, and due to graduate, so there was uh, there was quite an awareness of of the imminence of military service for that reason, as well as in general, you know, you knew of fellows that had either been drafted or had been called up or had 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 enlisted. So, uh, military service seemed like it was going to be inev inevitable. I was quite sure that I wasn't going to finish four years at MIT without going into service. Were you in any way exempt from service while you were in school? No, no. And the draft uh, was hanging heavily over your head well, as well, well as not, everybody else's? not else. heavily, not heavily. Um, and I th I'm not sure of the sequence. I think I might have beat them to the punch by, by enlisting before I had to register for the draft, so. You're, what, how did you finally get into the service then? You, you were at MIT and you thought about it, or then you enlisted. Why did you enlist? Well, well I was interested in airplanes. I had, my father uh, had two airplanes while I was growing up. I mean, he, he got interested in flying. He took flying lessons. And he used to take me to the airport on Saturdays when I was a kid. This was, you know, when I was 8, 10, 12 years old. And so I, I liked airplanes. Uh, I, I built model airplanes as a kid. So I was, you know, quite fascinated with, with this whole business of, of flying. And then a few of the fellows in my section at MIT were, joining, were going to join the Air Corps. So, you know, that might have been where I got the idea. And uh, if, if it was inevitable that I was going to go in the service, I would like to go somewhere doing what I, what I thought I would like to do. So, the, so your childhood interest in planes brought you to the Air Corps? Yeah, yeah. And so, so one day you went into Boston and signed up? So went into Boston and, well, I looked into what it took to, to sign up. And uh, then I, I told the folks what I was thinking of doing. I, I, I don't think they were happy with that, but uh, they also felt that, you know, if this is what I wanted to do, that's, you know, I, I should. So I, I enlisted in, in Boston. And then that was in the f late fall, I guess, of 42. And due to some follow-up, uh, I wasn't called until uh, May of 40, 40, 43, and if I hadn't inquir inquired as to my status, I might never have been called up. So. You just <laughs> fell between the cracks just, somewhere? I, I think so, I think so. Between, between New York and Boston, I, I think I fell between the cracks somewhere. When you signed up, did you do that alone or some your classmates went with you? I, I did it alone. I did it alone. I mean, some of my other classmates, I think, had done so and did so afterwards, but I went in by myself, so. And then finally in May, they, f they figured the war was lagging and they'd better look for you. And something like they that. They called you something up. Something like that, so. so you well, I, I came, we had classes on Saturday morning at MIT, and I came back from, from class, and there in the mail was a notice that said, uh, present myself at North Station on Tuesday morning, I think, so there wasn't much time to get things together. You're called up in May of 43, yeah. and where did, you, where did you go? First place I went was, they took us by train to Camp Devons, Fort Devons, and uh, we were there only overnight, or maybe a day or so, and then we went by train to Atlantic City. And which was the basic training center for, for the Air Force, the Air Corps. 
and, and I remember we arrived late in Atlanta. You know, it was all day train ride because you know troop trains would, would go along, and then if then we would be sidelined while other traffic took its place. So it, we arrived at Atlantic City late at night, and we were to be quartered in one of the hotels, and it, it might have been the ambassador. I'm not sure of the name. And one of the first things they they gave us was a gas mask. I don't think we even had uniforms at the time, but we got a gas mask, you know. <laughs> After traveling all day long and, you know, being tired and hungry and everything else, but no, they thought we needed to have, have gas masks. So, just in case. Just in case. <laughs> <clears throat> I, I, I just thought of something that we might have uh, asked here, but maybe it's self-evident, that when you joined the Air Corps, there was no question that you were in the Army and might be transferred into the Air Corps. You joined the Air Corps itself. I, I joined the Air Corps. I was, was signed up to become an aviation cadet, so, uh, which would have sent me to, well, I thought, <clears throat> I hoped it was going to be pilot training, but there was no question that I was going to be in the Air Corps. And did you have a choice as to what you would do in the Air Corps? No. No, we were, later on we were sent to a classification center in in Nashville, Tennessee, and that's where they determined whether we would be sent to pilot training mm -hmm. or to navigation training or to bombardier training. Tell us about the test you, you took so, to make that distinction. How did they decide you were better they, suited to be a navigator than a pilot, for example? They were subject to a battery of tests, and, and some, of them, some of them were or psychological tests, you know, where we where were interviewed and asked asked questions. Some of them had to do with you know hand-eye coordination, you know, tests. Uh, some of them were uh, were just just questions, as I said. But I think the classification was also influenced by the need at the time for whether they thought they were going to need pilots or, or bombardiers or navigators. So. Most of us were classified for, for pilot training, which was my first choice. And, but then I, I was not successful. Pilot training consisted of uh, primary, basic, and advanced. And, uh, and then, then you got your wings, and then after that you were sent you know, for specialized training. And I washed out halfway through primary training and which was which was a big disappointment. I thought I was doing quite well. Uh, I had soloed, and you know I thought I knew what it was all about. But uh, the reason that they gave for washing me out was that I was not making sufficient progress. Uh, in hindsight, you know, probably I, I mean, <clears throat> I was reclassified as a navigator. Ultimately, I became a navigator, and probably I was a better navigator than I ever would have been a pilot. So all this at Tennessee, all this happened no, to you? No, no. The, uh, the classification was at Tennessee. Then we were sent to Maxwell Field for pre-flight school, which was pilots pre-flight training. And Maxwell Field was, was arduous. Where was that? that Max, uh, Montgomery, Alabama. Okay. And then from, from Maxwell, we went to, well, that was late fall of, of uh, 43, we, we actually got uh, leave to go home for Christmas. And then uh, af after Christmas, we were sent to uh, Lakeland, Florida for primary pilot training. So that was the Ludwig School of Aviation. That was not an air base. It was a, a flying school that was under contract with the Army to to teach us to fly, and the flying instructors that we had were civilians. They were not, not army pilots. But then the, the Czech pilots uh, were army pilots, and it was one of the Czech pilots that decided that, you know, I should be eliminated from pilot training. Can you talk about that disappointment for a moment? Um, 
Were other men washed out as well? Uh, were you all by yourself standing on the field one day? No, no, no. Quite a, quite a few of us were washed out. Uh, and I don't know what the percentage was. I mean, I, uh, I, I don't know that it was as high as, as high as 20 percent. I think it was higher than 10 percent. Did you know prior to that that if you don't, didn't become a pilot, uh, there were other jobs that the Air Force really needed to be filled? No, out? no, no. Uh, <clears throat> I was fortunate in that I was reclassified for, for navigation training. Uh, others who were washed out of pilot training uh, went to gunnery school and became gunners or, or radio operators or something like that. So uh, the, the only commissioned uh, officers on the airplanes were pilots, bombardiers, and navigators. So. Uh, it was was a, a, a good consolation if you were reclassified either for navigation school or for bombardier school, and you know an even bigger disappointment if you were sent off elsewhere. Did you take another battery of tests to show that you had navigational skills? I think no. They probably knew that I had navigational skills on the basis of the test that we took in Nashville mm -hmm. and uh, then they looked up my record probably and said well okay we we can send this guy to navigation school he's okay he, he should be able to he'll make it through there now was that at the same place in Florida or did you go somewhere else oh no the the next place we went to was Moody Field in Georgia which uh, we were just parked there until they assembled enough of us to send us on to the next phase. And the next, navigators and bombardiers also had to be aerial gunners. So we had to go to aerial gunnery school and go through that complete training uh, before we would be sent on to either bombardier school or navigation school. Where was that training given? So that was in Fort Myers in Florida. It was called Buckingham Army Airfield. Tell us about learning to be an aerial gunner. That was was interesting and easy because you know I was mechanically inclined and and liked the the equipment, so we learned. Well, I guess the first thing we had to learn to do was to take the machine guns apart and put them together, and ultimately you had to learn how to do that you know blindfolded, but we learned about gun gun turrets and how those operated. Uh, there was a lot of shooting. There was there was riflery. There was skeet shooting, which was fun. Uh, and, we, and there was uh, aerial shooting where we we were in airplanes and we shot at, at tow targets. So you know, on the whole, gunnery school was was fun. You know, and it was was easy too. It was you were but Fort Myers was was a, one of the crummiest places. You know, and not so now. Yeah, I mean. People, people talk about going to Fort Myers, and you know, I, I, I don't say anything about the opinion that I formed back in 1944, whenever it was. So. What was so bad about it at, in those days? Well, there were a lot of cockroaches in the uh, in the barracks. Of course, that was a fact of life in in the South, anyway. But the water had a terrible sulfur smell, and it was, and it was hot. There was, you know, there was no, no vegetation to speak of around there. It was just a crummy place. And you know, Fort Myers wasn't much of a town either. So it's changed, I gather. I, well, I haven't been there, but it, I, I, I gather from its popularity that yes, it's changed. What was it like for you to be up in a plane? What kind of plane were you flying at, shooting at the tow target? We were, we were in B-17s, and we shot out of the waste windows at tow targets that were being towed by uh, B-26s, not A-26s, B-26s. Marauders. And marauders, right. And, uh, and I remember that there were, there were the, uh, the WASP pilots, you know, the, uh, the female pilots were flying both the tow targets and, uh, and on one or two occasions, we had female co-pilots in the B-17, too. So. 
So, you know, they would, I guess there would be a bunch of us in the airplane and, you know, we would take turns shooting at the, shooting at the target, so. How could they tell which holes in the sleeve were yours? I, I think that uh, there was some sort of grease paint or something on the bullets, so that, I mean, there was a color coding system. Can you remember the first time you ever went up in a B-17? Well, no, I can't remember it, but it was, but the first time I ever went in one was in gunnery school. Mm -hmm. I guess that's my question, to, to be for the first time in, in a 17 and riding in it and feeling the vibration and the noise of it. Can you remember that? No, no. Okay, where did you go from there? Then you from, were going to navigational school. Well, they, well then I was fortunate to be sent. There were several navigation schools that I could have been sent to. I was fortunate in that I was sent to Carl Gables, Florida, and that was a navigation school that was run under contract by Pan American for the, for the Army. So uh, not only, you know, it was, it was a great place because we were quartered at the University of Miami, and there were co-eds and everything like that around there. And, uh, and then we flew in flying boats out of Dinner Key. And the, uh, the navigation uh, course was, was first class. And uh, the instructors that we had, both classroom and flying instructors, were uh, Pan American personnel. So, you know, they were experienced in, in their trade. About what was the date now, Matt? Uh, well, that would have been probably around May of 40, 43, no, May of 44. May of, May of 44. 44. And navigation school lasted from about three months from May until August of 44 when And you've been in the graduated. service just a year. Right. Okay. Right. At, <clears throat> did the military, in, in addition to everything else they were teaching you, did they prepare you for cultural differences that you might run into when and if you went overseas? No, no, no. Uh, in, res in looking at your questionnaire about that question, uh, my first reaction was that the, uh, I was exposed to the cultural differences uh, in the U.S. to a greater extent in the Army than I ever had been before, and I was was quite impressed with with how differently uh, the um, the fellows from different parts of the country thought, and despite the fact that we all had similar backgrounds, I mean we were in a sense an elite in as much as you know we got into cadet training in pretty much the same way and from the same background, so uh, we were all you know generally middle class fellows, but yet there was quite. from New York and the fellows from, from New England. And then in, in being in the South, you know, where most of the training took place because, you know, that was dic dictated by the weather as much as anything, uh, you know, we're aware of uh, big differences. I mean, first of all, we encountered grits for the first time, which I had never seen before, but also we're aware of the uh, uh, the, the segregation practices that were, you know, common in the South at, at that time. Did you begin to make new friends uh, as you went into some of these units where it was more permanent for you? Well, I was, yeah, I was stationed for months at a time in various places, so I became friend <laughs> Early on, you know, we spent about three months in Buffalo uh, at Canisius College in what was called the College Training Detachment, which was kind of a parking program. They got us into the pipeline and they knew where we were. Uh, but I became friendly with a few of the fellows there. And then when I was in, uh, well, then a few of us had been together, so we ended up, you know, uh, through Cal classification, pre-flight school, and so forth together. So, you know, we continued as friends. 
and then I got to know some a number of other fellows in navigation school, and you know I became friendly with, mm -hmm. with some of those. And then later on, I became friendly with uh, some of the fellows on the crew that I ended up on. So yeah, I I was was stationed in period in places for periods of time long enough so that you know uh, you became friendly with people. As you were in these places and you're in the service now for about a year, uh, did you follow the course of the war? Listen to what was going on? Not much. I mean, we were. At least I was generally indifferent to the uh, to the course of the war. I mean, you know, we we knew what was going on in, in broad terms, but uh, we're generally preoccupied with what we were doing. I mean, the uh, we were kept busy and with with not much time for reflection. And uh, and when they when they did let us out, you know, we were uh, more anxious to amuse ourselves and get into mischief than, than to worry about what the war was doing. You spoke a minute ago about uh, your navigational training. Tell us a little bit about that. How do you learn to navigate from one point to another? <clears throat> there's, there's pilotage where you have a map and you can see the ground and, uh, and you know where you want to be on the map so you, you uh, you look from the map to the ground and follow your way along. There's dead reckoning where uh, you proceed on a certain certain heading at a certain speed, and you know that in a certain length of time you will have proceeded you know so many miles along that course. Uh, dead reckoning involves in an airplane at least knowing something about what you have to account for the wind. So, because you know the wind causes the airplane to drift off the the course that it's headed in, but dead reckoning is uh, is essentially calculating you know where you where you are from after having started from some place. Then there is celestial navigation, which uh, is a way of determining your position on the surface of the Earth from uh, sites that are made of of stars, and and we had to learn we had to learn that. Of course, the celestial navigation was was the most challenging, you know, intellectually because uh, it involved you know precision measurements and and a fair amount of calculation. But it was was interesting. You know, I could understand what that was all about. And uh, and then we. At first, we learned to do this on, on paper in the classroom with, with charts in front of us. And then uh, we, had, we had airborne training, too. And, and we were flying in uh, flying boats. They were called Commodores. These are Pan American flying boats made by Consolidated. So these are twin-engine flying boats that uh, flew at about 60 knots. They took off at 60 knots. And it was a great navigational trainer because if the airplane is only flying at 60 knots, then you know a 20 or 30 knot wind has a substantial uh, influence on, on where the airplane is going. So you know, it was kind of fun to to take off from the water and to land on the water again. So. And then we would fly it. We would fly at night uh, as much as in the daytime because. Uh, and at nighttime, we practiced the celestial navigation. So we would, we would take turns going back to the Astrodome with our octants, uh, and we called our instruments were octants, not sextants, and they used a bubble for the uh, for the level reference instead of the the horizon, which a seaman would use. But uh, we would take turns going back to the Astrodome and uh, picking out three stars and getting the uh, the three sites, and then we would go back to the to the navigation table and work out the fix while one of the other fellows, you know, took his turn at the star site. And uh, I think we got pretty good at that. When you're when you're flying, you know, if you know where you are within five miles, you're doing you're doing marvelously well. So, what do you do on a cloudy night? 
we were always flying above, well, I mean, in the Commodores, on a cloudy night, I guess we wouldn't fly, but uh, in a B-17, you were above the weather, so. But in a B-17, I never had to use celestial navigation other than in, in practice. I mean, they would, they would send us out uh, on training missions, both here and, and occasionally in England, to maintain a, a proficiency in celestial navigation. But, but in combat, you know, we, we flew in the daytime, and the last, I mean, we just didn't need celestial navigation. That's quite true. Um, this is into 44. Um, you've had D-Day now, the invasion of Europe. Yeah, and we remember that because we're, this one I was in Carl Gables and, uh, and you know, there was a morning, morning muster and they essentially stopped the program for a while to tell us about D-Day and what was going on and so forth. So, so I remember that quite clearly, so. Must have been a sense of anticipation in your group then? It was just big news. It was big news. I, I, uh, D-Day was largely a ground effort, so it, it probably didn't lead to a, a great sense of anticipation on the part of us future airmen that it would have otherwise. So, Tell us about graduation. The, well, about a week before graduation, uh, playing volleyball, which was part of the physical training program, I, I had broken my finger, and it was, was that finger. And uh, by this time, we had, we had ordered our uniforms, and we had gotten all the equipment and so forth, and with a broken finger, I might not have graduated. So uh, the, we had, I think he was called a flight surgeon anyway, the, the doctor uh, took the, the splint and bandage off, you know, so that I could graduate. Uh, and then, then we were given leave after graduation, so I had to wear the splint again, so, you know, while I went home. So, you know, I can remember that part of the graduation as much as anything else, but, but you know, we made it. now. Uh, by this time, uh, navigators were not all being commissioned second lieutenants. Uh, I guess the Army felt that, you know, we're, we're getting to have too many of those. So they, uh, they created a new grade, which was called flight officer, which was equivalent to, to warrant officer. So it was a disappointment for those of us who were become were going to become those of us who were told we were going to be flight officers. I was fortunate in that uh, I was told I was going to be a second lieutenant. But I remember some of the fellows in my class being disappointed over over this. You know, this was kind of a uh, second prize thing too. I mean, flight officers had the they wore the same uniforms, they had the same pay and the same privileges and everything like that. Except that instead of gold bars, they had what they called the blue pickle, which was, you know, the same size, but it had uh, a gold band in the middle and, and uh, blue on the ends. The blue pickle, so, I hadn't, I'd never so, heard so. that before. And one of, good, good friend of mine, his name was Sam Alvino, felt that maybe he was make, going to be made a flight officer because he was Italian or something like that, you know. And that, uh, he was he were a little bit sensitive about that, and I think he said something like that to his father in a letter, and his father really read him out in the in the return letter that you know you, that's not the kind of attitude you should have. So you know I, I remember that quite well because Sam and I had become friendly, and uh, and we saw one another you know a number of times after the war and so forth. You know I he he lived in Jersey. It wasn't too big a deal to go from from New York to New Jersey to visit Sam. So. What happened to you then? Did you, um, you got, did you came home and you met your, you saw your family and then did, you went back to duty and, where? Well then, then we were sent to, uh, to Tampa to Plant Park which was, you know, a replacement depot. 
And we waited, I mean, here we were bombardiers and navigators and, and so forth, waiting for assignment. So then I was assigned from Plant Park to, to Drew Field in Tampa to join uh, where, where the B-17, where B-17 crews were being formed and Drew Field was a replacement training unit. So crews were assembled and they, they trained as crews and that was the first time that, you know, that I was in a crew with two pilots and a bombardier and, you know, radio operators and gunners and, and all that. So that was the training. The part way through that training, I was taken from the crew that I was assigned to and assigned to another crew that was further along because they had lost their navigator because uh, another crew lost the navigator to appendicitis and they were about to go, so they took Joe Goodwall. I met him, I guess, once or twice. Uh, and then I was assigned to, to Gene Gerke's crew. So they were, they had been in training together for a few weeks, you know, by the time I joined them. Gene so Gerke, is the, the, that the pilot? Gerke was the pilot, Gene Gerke. He was from, he was from Flint, Michigan. So, so that crew was, uh, Gene Gerke was the pilot and Everett Lundstrom was the co-pilot and George Waymire was the bombardier and I was the navigator. And then Jack Kerfus was the flight engineer, which was, and he was also the top turret gunner. And Jimmy Rotella was the radio operator, and he was a gunner. And then Charlie Lycano was one of the waste gunners. And Melvin Feller was our ball turret gunner, and Bill Murray was our tail gunner. And Charlie. Charlie Lycano was, was a little bit older, and he had flown uh, on his own before. So uh, Everett Lundstrom uh, and Charlie got along well together, and a lot of times uh, Everett would let Charlie sit in on the, uh, on the flight deck and let Charlie fly for a while when we were just, you know, flying around Florida. Where did you fly to, did, did, and why? Uh, well, a lot of it was, was uh, formation flying practice, so mm -hmm. we were just, just flying out, out and around, you know, over the Gulf. But, uh, you know, at nighttime we'd fly to, to maybe Alabama or something like that on a night mission, you know, taking star sights and things like that. About how many B-17s would be in a, in a group, not a group, in, in your particular package of planes? The, well, Basic formation flying involves three aircraft, so you know we might have—I don't remember exactly—we might have flown in in, uh, in groups of three when we we're when the fellows were practicing formation flying. With the anticipation but, that uh, you certainly felt that you're you're getting ready to go overseas at this time. Oh yeah, and we we're quite sure that we we're destined to go to to go to Europe because that's where they were flying you know, more B-17s than anything else. I mean, we, we knew that we were slated to become an 8th Air Force crew, B-17 crew. And did you finally get the call to come overseas? Well, I mean, then, I mean, the crew train, trained together, and then when we finished our training, we went to uh, someplace in Georgia outside of uh, Atlanta, I think it was Hunter Field, and that's where we're issued our our flight gear. Uh, so we've got parachutes and uh, oxygen masks and you know uh, electrically heated suits and all all that and parachutes. And I said that. And then we then we went up to Fort Dix in New Jersey, uh, waiting uh, for a ship. Some some of the crews were were selected to to fly across the ocean because uh, they had to get uh, newly made B-17s, you know, across the ocean. But I guess there were, there were more crews uh, than there were B-17s that needed to be ferried, so most of us went by, were going by ship in those days. So you, you, you were still a group that you mentioned the names no, before? No, we're, 
Well, we're a crew. A crew. We're, we're a crew. But you're going over on a ship, we're and if I'm uh, looking at the notes we talked about before, you went over first class. We went, Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about that. Well, we were, I think it was Camp Dix, and it's not Camp, it was Camp Dix in Jersey. And we were there for, oh, the better part of a week. And I can remember the song that we heard over the PA system most all the time was, uh, don't fence me in, you know, give me land, lots of land, that, that song. So this was in December of 1944. And, uh, and there were a whole bunch of nurses that, uh, you know, we met some of those girls in the officers' club, you know, for the few days that we were, we were waiting. And then uh, next thing you know, we we're all you know on the Queen Elizabeth together. And as I as I told you earlier, there were about 500 Air Corps officers and 500 uh, of these girls, the the nurses, on board the ship. And we were seated together in the main dining room, and there were tables of I think it was tables of eight. It might have been might have been more uh, round tables. And uh, so there, at a table there were four of us and four nurses. I think we were allowed to sort that out ourselves. And uh, we had uh, tablecloths and, uh, and cloth napkins and silverware. And we had, we had soup and we had fish and we had uh, a main course and so forth. You know, <laughs> you know Kennard was, was, trying to, was trying to impress us with with their grandeur, I guess, or you know, or, or their way of doing things, and uh, and I had gotten cozy with with one of the girls after, you know, through through this voyage, and uh, I think yeah, on the last night of the thing, uh, I had su sufficient enterprise to allow one of the elevator operators, there are elevators up and down, I asked him whether he would uh, leave us between floors for, for a while. So yeah, he, he, he did that and you know, Ella Mae Johnson was her name, she and I smooched her a little bit. I gave her a pair of my wings and uh, then, uh, then af afterwards she went, on to, she went on to the continent and you know, we used to correspond. Uh, but. You know, it uh, this would, was never really an affair, but it, it ended after we, you know, after the war ended. So, how many but, other men were on board the ship? Not not in the dining room with you. Oh, a lot. There were, and <clears throat> the number that sticks in my mind was eighteen thousand. And in the in the staterooms, I think there might have been. Uh, maybe 18 bunks or something. And then these are pipe berths. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, we were all young and slender, so we, we could fit. But, uh, but I, I'm not so sure that rolling over was all that easy. So, you know, it was, it was pretty crowded, so. Do you remember where you sailed from? What was it right we out We sailed of? from New York. New York Harbor? Yeah. And where did you sail to? We sailed to, we sailed to Scotland, and it was either Greenock or Gorick which was, you know, deep water port for maybe Glasgow, I'm not sure. So, uh, and, and we didn't dock there, the, the ship was anchored and we were taken off by, you know, by launch, mm -hmm. you know, bunches of at a time. Theoretically, the queens were so fast they could uh, outrun the subs, so were you part of any convoy system? No, no, the, all by the, yourself? The, the Queen Elizabeth and Queen Mary uh, didn't, didn't run in convoys, they, they ran by themselves. And there, I can remember a few times when there were abrupt course changes, which we surmised or wondered whether maybe this had been, you know, uh, in response to something that they perceived as a, as a threat. Tell us about landing now in, uh, up in Scotland and where you went. What did you do there? Well, it was a drizzly morning and, well, then I guess we ended up on trains and we went to a place called Stone. And this was, this was just before Christmas now of 44. And, and that's, that's where, we, where we spent Christmas. I remember uh, 
and it was it was a cold, dreary place, and uh, and they didn't let us out, so there wasn't much that we got to we got to see. This was our first exposure to uh, to British fare, and I remember the sugar was, you know, that we put in the coffee was a great deal coarser than what we're used to at home, and the bread was also quite coarse. And it seemed like there was more tea in the diet than, than there was coffee. And that's almost my only recollection of, of Stone. But from Stone, then we were there only a few days. And then we were, uh, we were sent to, uh, to our groups. I mean, you know, some of us were sent here, some of us were sent there. And our crew was sent to, then to Great Ashfield, which was our base. Were you aware at this time of the Battle of the Bulge and the uh, the ground war in Europe? Yeah, yeah. And on the on the boat, we had been given we had been given K rations for some reason, uh, and and those were collected from us when we got off. And we were told that you know they needed those rations rather desperately uh, on the continent, you know, because of this this bulge situation. So you you so, gave up your food supply uh, well, to be I mean, sent over to the continent. Well, I mean, we we were told we had to turn them in. So yeah, it was, it was. I mean, we didn't do this with any reluctance, but it wasn't voluntary. I mean, we were we were doing as we were told. What unit were you in now specifically? So now I was I was with the 385th Bomb Group in the 549th Bomb Squadron. So the Eighth Air Force. The, yeah, the Eighth yeah. Air Force was organized into three divisions. There was, and the first and the third divisions flew B-17s, and the second division flew B-24s. The the 385th Bomb Group was a third division group. And at an air base, a bomber base, uh, a group would house, would consist of four squadrons. So the, the four squadrons that comprised the group were all housed on the same base. And then uh, the, the four squadrons in the 385th were the 548th, 549th, 550th and the 551st, and the, the the squadrons were were known as the uh, the red red squadron, the yellow squadron, the blue squadron, and the green squadron. And the 549th was the yellow squadron. And unique uh, a unique feature of the 385th bomb group was that. It didn't have squadron code letters on the side of the fuselages, but the squadron uh, was signified by the color of the, the domes on the propellers. So we had yellow propeller domes on, on our, our airplanes. Most every other group had the squadron codes, uh, two-letter code on the, on the side of the airplane. Did you and, have your druthers as to whether or not uh, you flew in B-24s or B-17s? No, I mean that was that was preordained when we were sent to uh, to Drew Field in in Florida. I mean that was B-17 training. So personally, did you have any feeling about the distinction between the two planes? Uh, I thought the B-17 was was the better airplane. Can you tell us why? Well, I I guess I just liked the shape of it better. You know, I mean from from my boyhood, you know, it looked like a nice airplane. Uh, when we're when we're actually flying, uh, we we developed a, high, a warm regard for the B-17. Uh, its chief virtue was its ability to withstand withstand battle damage, and uh, and the B-24, being a more sophisticated machine, was not so uh, you know was not so robust. So you know that endeared. The, uh, the B-17 to those of us that flew in those. And the B-17, among the pilots, they preferred it because it was easier to fly in formation than, than the B-24. 
So, uh, you know, the, but, you know, there was this rivalry between B-17s and B-24s for, you know, which, which was the better airplane and all that. I was going to ask you that. Did you have occasion uh, to talk with guys who flew in the 24s? Well, I've, I have a friend that lives in Seattle that was a B-24 pilot, so, you know, he and I needle one another about, <laughs> about that when, on the occasions that we've, we've been together. What feeling did 24 guys have uh, about you in 17s? Didn't they think they were better? Well, in, in later years, the B-24 guys always thought that the, uh, that the B-17s won the publicity battle. You know, we got more press coverage and so forth. So. Gregory Peck flew in 17s and, right. and not in, in 24s. Right, right, right. What was your rank at this time, Matt? Well, I was second lieutenant. I mean, I was, when I was finished navigation school, I was commissioned as a second lieutenant. And could you recall any other <laughs> units that were near you on your field or off your field? Well, on our field was just the four squadrons. And then there was a, there was a B-24 group not far away. And I mean, all of, most all of the 8th Air Force bomb and fighter groups were concentrated in, in East Anglia, so we were not very far from, from one another. Were the clothes that you had that you, I guess the, the ones you were issued in Florida, I guess is what you told us, uh, were they adequate for the climate you were in? We were, dress, dress clothing uh, we bought ourselves. I mean, we were given a, a uniform allowance and we had to buy the, uh, our own dress clothes. Then we were, we were issued uh, OD clothing, you know, the, uh, the olive drab shirts and the pants and, <clears throat> and underwear and socks and, and, all, and things like that. But, the, but even in Florida, we had to buy, you know, both summer and winter clothes. So, uh, yeah, we were, we were well clothed between what was issued to us and what, you know, what we owned ourselves. And then, you know, on top of that, we had the flying clothing, which um, by this time was, was no longer the, uh, the fleece-lined leather stuff. It was the, uh, the, the you know, olive drab colored taffeta with the, uh, with the mouton collars and stuff like that. So it was, was good with good clothing. What was England like at this time? My impression is that the whole area that you were in was just one solid airfield after another. Uh, can you describe what you saw when you took off and flew around that area? Well, I mean, you're you're correct. I mean, there was there were airplane airfields all over the place. England just struck us all as being kind of quaint. I mean, everything was was smaller. The uh, the railroad cars were were smaller. Uh, you know, the the towns were smaller. The the streets and the towns were smaller. Uh, it was, as I say, you know. Nowadays, quaint is the adjective that comes to mind. You know, in in describing how I felt about England at the time, so. but the weather was dreary, and and I remember a phenomenon called hoar frost that I had never seen before, is H O A R, and in the morning sometimes on on the on the wires and on the tree limbs and stuff like that, uh, you know, a limb the diameter of a pencil might have a, a coating of frost. You know about mm -hmm. you know an inch inch and a half in diameter on it, so you know which would go away shortly after the sun came up. You're getting and, ready and, for combat at this time, I. Uh, yeah, we I assume. Well, we we came into a barracks, which was a uh, which was a Nissen hut, which is like a Quonset hut, and uh, and we the bunks that we were assigned to were had recently been vacated by a crew that had been shot down. So, uh, and then on the, on the wall just to the left of the door, there was a, there was a list of MIAs and KIAs. 
and uh, you know, then you knew that you know serious stuff is is going on here. That's missing in action or killed in action. Right, right, right. So you are taking space formula, uh, formerly we, occupied by another crew. That's right. We were we were replacing. It's kind of spooky, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then, then we had to be instructed into into the ways in which things were done in the United Kingdom. Uh, we had to. The navigators had to learn how to use the G box, which was the British equivalent of Loran. Well, it was probably the forerunner of Loran. No, and uh, the G coverage uh, in the United Kingdom was was very good, and you know could find out where you were within a few feet almost. Can you tell us what G coverage is? Well, it's uh, there are stations on the ground. That, that transmit, there's a master station and a slave station, and then on the basis of the time difference from, of the signals from these, there are lines of position that are, uh, that are plotted, and these would appear on a, on a G chart. So uh, from one station, you would get a line of position one way, and from another station, you'd get another one, and that would tell you where you are, which was technically you know the same concept as as Loran was, and uh, you could you could navigate you know around around England very nicely with with Loran. It didn't work over the continent because the Germans you know jammed it. But then we had we had a lot of another dose of practice missions and formation flying and and all of that. And you know there are radio procedures that the operators had to, the radio operators had to learn. So uh, we flew as uh, you know we flew pra practice missions. Then uh, we were split up. Uh, we we didn't we didn't fly together as a crew right off. Uh, you know I flew a mission with an, with another crew and. And our George the Bombardier flew a mission, his first mission with another crew, and finally we flew together as as a crew after you know one or two missions. But you had but been on a, a combat mission with another group before you went with, with another your own. crew. With Tell another us crew. about your first combat mission. First combat mission. Tell was... Tell us about getting up that morning, and going to the briefing. The I don't remember it very well. I mean, I, I remember what it, what it consisted of from you know subsequent uh, experiences. I don't remember that that very morning. I uh, the target was Castle in Germany. I remember that, and it was was not a difficult mission. You know, we we saw a flak uh, throughout the time that I was flying. We didn't see any fighters. I mean, one time I saw one of their jet fighters, the ME-262, coming through the formation. Mm -hmm. The uh, the thing that we had to put up with and contend with was was flak, which was, you know, quite quite heavy and quite accurate. So, let me ask you a question that goes back to the very beginning. Your parents came from Germany, and your your ancestral perspective is German. How did you feel about going over and bombing it? I was, <clears throat> was asked that question when I was being, a year or two earlier, back in Nashville. I was, there was a test called ARMA test, Attitude Regarding Military Aviation. And, and I was asked about that, and I, uh, I said that, you know, as far as I was concerned, I wouldn't have any trouble, you know, shooting my uncle down. It turns out that my mother's youngest brother was, in fact, a German flyer during the 30s, and he was in Spain with the Condor Legion. Uh, in later years, I learned that uh, he was an inspector at the Messerschmitt plant in Augsburg, uh, you know, during the time that I was in England. But I, I didn't have any compunctions about that. Uh, I didn't, I didn't really know. The, 
uh, those relatives. Uh, you know, we used to get Christmas cards and all that sort of thing. Uh, I, you know, I could speak German, and uh, I, since then, since then I have wondered how I would have fared if I had ever been shot down and captured in Germany, whether I would have had sense enough to, to keep my mouth shut or, or, you know, whether I would have let on that I could speak German and, and all this sort of thing. You know, I, 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 might have ha I might have had a rough time in the, in the interrogation because I think I was enough of a, well, I'm not going to say wise guy, but, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know how it, I would have reacted. And it's, it's certainly good that that, that didn't happen. For the, I went back to Europe in 1977. I was had business in the Netherlands, and then I went to went to Germany to look up the relatives in in uh, both Augsburg and and Jettingen. And they wanted to know, you know, uh, you know what what I had done during the war, and. Uh, I, I didn't want to lie to those people, but I didn't also didn't want to tell them, you know, what I'd been doing. So that was, uh, so I just said that, yes, I was was in the army, and I, you know, I, I flew, but I never left never left the U.S. So we left it at that. Uh, it's it's hard to be in Europe nowadays, or well, it was you know back in the 70s and the 80s. And not be reminded of the war, either from the bullet holes that you still see in the masonry, you know, around the railroad stations, or all of the men that are missing limbs, you see. And my cousin's husband was wounded in in Russia, and you know he walked with a great big limp. And there was another cousin that uh, that was was wounded and and died, you know. So and then you know in seeing, you know pictures of these of these guys you know in in, uh, in different uniforms and so forth uh, you know it, it kind of gives you the willies you said a moment ago I think I heard you say that uh, except for with a, a brush for it with a 262 you you didn't see other uh, enemy aircraft do I did I hear you say that that's right that's right just we, flak we not had, just flak but flak yeah, we had fighter escort. I mean, you know, we were happy to see these P-51s flying along with us, and you know, they'd, they'd wave or something like that, and you knew that you were in good hands. And then after, oh, I don't know, somewhere between 15 and 20 missions, we were sent to a rest home, and uh, which was in, in Hampshire, which is west of London, in a, in a big estate. And there were a bunch of bunch of us, you know. Well, the four officers from our crew, but there were a bunch of fighter pilots at the rest home too. And we all wore civilian clothes for about a week, so we got to know some of the fighter pilots. And these were fighter pilots from the group that had escorted us. So, so you know, it was, you know, there was it was good rapport between between them and us. And then one time, after VE Day. A few of us from our crew visited uh, some of the fellows at the uh, at the fighter base that you know we had gotten to know. So that was kind of fun. So, so the fifty ones were not on the same base as you. You rendezvoused with them somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. Well, the <clears throat> they would they would join the bomber stream. Uh, we would, you know, we had to take up and take off and assemble the airplanes in our group, and then uh, then the airplanes in. Then, then four groups comprised a wing, combat bomb wing. So then the wing was formed, and uh, and then then the division was formed. So you know all this traffic got sorted out between the time you took off and the time that you got to the the Dutch coast. And you know then you know the P fifty ones would appear. Now they could fly. They could fly faster, and they didn't. They didn't need to accompany us across the channel or anything like that. They would. They would pick us up, you know, going into Germany. Some of the classic raids were um, Regensburg, Schweinfurt, um, 
deep into the uh, eastern side of Germany. Did you participate in anything like that? Well, I went to Berlin a couple of times, and that was a long, long schlep, if you will. Yeah. <clears throat> Tell us about flying to Berlin. <clears throat> It was long. Berlin was heavily defended. You know, there was a lot of a lot of flak. You know, we, we didn't like going to Berlin. So, in the morning, when when you got up and went over to the briefing hut, is that the first inkling you would have as to where you were going that day? Yeah, yeah. We <clears throat> we would, they would wake us. You know the. Uh, uh, Fellows would come through the barracks and you know wake those of us that was scheduled to fly, and they would tell us you know it's three o'clock now briefing at four or something like that or four o'clock now, so uh, we would have to get up we'd have to get dressed, we'd go to the go to the mess hall and get fed, and then we'd appear at the briefing, and it was only at the briefing when they you know they opened the curtain just like mm -hmm. they do in the movies and you could see this red line going from from here to to there, and uh, then after the briefing, you know, they would usually tell us, you know, why we're, why that target had been selected, and then navigators went to their specialized briefing, and bombardiers went to their specialized briefing, and, uh, and they got their bombing tables and stuff like that for the, for the ordnance that they were, they were carrying that day, and then we would go and draw our flight gear. I mean, we, we had our own stuff, but it was, was not with us in the barracks. It was uh, at, the, at the shack or wherever it was where the parachutes and the oxygen masks and the heated suits and all that were stored. So you, you would draw out your, your gear, load it into the parachute bag, or, or get dressed, and, uh, and then the trucks would take us out to the airplanes. And then... Uh, this was usually where we met the enlisted men for the first time. And then we would have to, as often as not, we would have to pull the propellers through because, you know, the radial engines would collect oil in the bottom cylinders and you couldn't start the engine until you got the oil out of the cylinders. So that meant, you know, winding the propeller around several times. And usually it took two of us on a blade to do that. I mean, it was, you know, it was, it was a good workout. It warmed you up. and. Uh, we didn't always have the same, at first we didn't always have the same airplane. Uh, after a while, uh, we acquired the one that we had, which was called Hell's Bells. So, you know, then we got to know the, uh, the crew chief and, and his assistant, you know. What's it like to stand out in a field in England, misty and it's chilly, and you know you're going to go to Berlin? What do you feel about that? The, the worst, worst times that I could recall were the times when we would stand down for a while. I mean, if you didn't fly for several days, or maybe as long as a week, that happened, you know, once or twice, then when they'd wake you, it was, was hard to get up. I mean, you, you know, this, that, was, that was scary. When, when we were flying, uh, it was, you were busy. I mean, you had to concentrate on, particularly as a navigator, you had to concentrate on what you were doing, but, you know, others had to concentrate on what, what they were doing, too. And, uh, you know, if a flak burst, you know, what you could hear was, was unnerving. Uh, seeing somebody else go down was, was unnerving. But uh, it, it wasn't particularly, I mean, if you looked ahead and you, and you, you saw the barrage of flak that you knew you had to fly through, you know, that um, made you make the sign of a cross or something like that and keep your fingers crossed. The, uh, the Germans, uh, over the heavily defended targets, would put up what's called a box barrage. I mean, it would be this many miles and, and this many, you know, feet and, and maybe this wide, and uh, they, the, the 88s and the flak shells would be timed to go off at a certain altitude, so they would fill this, this box with, with a barrage because they knew that the bombers were going to have to fly through that. 
So that was like, you know, trying to run through a shower without getting wet. I mean, it was... Somebody always got wet, didn't they? Some, not always, but quite frequently somebody got wet, so... Well, I mean, we came back with holes in the airplanes, airplane a few times, but fortunately, none of us in our crew ever got hurt, so... When you saw planes going down, did you know, um, could you tell at a distance what plane that was, who was in it? The, no, because I never saw a plane leave our element. I mean, I knew, you know, I knew who, who the three planes we were flying with were, but we never lost anybody from our element. So if it was somebody else from the group, I wouldn't know until that evening, you know, who was that had gone down. And, you know, when you see them go down, then you look to see how many... Well, as a navigator, I was also kind of the scorekeeper. I mean, if, if an airplane went down, I was supposed to record that in the log, note whether any shoots, parachutes came out and things like that, so... Do you know, uh, f from your own experience, uh, how many guys were recovered after, after they bailed out? Depend on where they came down, I suppose. Most of them were taken prisoner. I mean, assuming, assuming that they bailed out over Germany, they were taken prisoner. And a couple of years ago, oh, I guess last year, I went to a bomb group reunion, was the first one that I ever gone to, uh, and it was in Savannah, Georgia. And there, I think they, they had the fellows who had been PWs stand up or something like that, and it was a big percentage. I mean, a lot of, a lot of air crews were, were shot down and taken prisoner, so. Did you ever get any, hear any stories about how they were treated after they were captured? They were, well, if it was bad news to be, it was good if you were captured by, the, by Luftwaffe personnel. Uh, it was not good to be captured by SS personnel, and it was not good to be captured by civilians. And uh, there was one story of uh, a navigator that was murdered by, by the civilians. And, the, uh, and I think the bombardier had to go through this small town with the, uh, with the body in a wheelbarrow or something like that. And bombardiers, the, <clears throat> there are fuses on the nose and tail of each bomb. And, uh, and the fl there was a little propeller that unscrewed, and when that unscrewed and fell off, then the bomb was, was armed. To keep the propeller from unscrewing prematurely, it was secured with a cutter pin. So while we're over the channel, George the bombardier, or whoever the bombardier was, had to go back in the bomb bay, pull out the fuses, I mean, pull out the cutter pins, and he had to bring those back to the base with him because, you know, they wanted to make sure that the bombardier had pulled the pins and all that. Uh, if a bombardier was shot down and he had those pins in his pocket, you know, that was, was kind, of, kind of an unfortunate thing, too, so. This is the part of the arming wire that uh, went into the, uh, the little pro propellers on the bombs? Well, the, the, the propeller unscrewed. I mean, the wind would make the propeller unscrew. To keep the propeller from unscrewing, there was a cotter pin so that it couldn't be screwed until the cotter pin was pulled out. So drum, bombs could be dropped on safe. They wouldn't explode. The, if, that's right. If the cotter pins weren't pulled out, the bomb wouldn't explode. What did you hear about German planes, and, and what did you think about going up against uh, these people? And, and then after the fact, it, it was, did your opinion change about their, their quality? No, we, we had the feeling that those were good airplanes. and. Uh, and they were also very effective. I mean, when, when they did attack a formation, they usually did so with devastating results because uh, the, the tactic that they would use was called a company front, and perhaps four would come along abreast, and they would, they would pick out a bomber, and they'd either come from directly ahead or directly behind, and, uh, and they'd concentrate on, on one bomber. And, uh, and usually that bomber was, was a goner. And we were, we were briefed on, you know, the, the tactics for dealing with the company front attack and, and things like that. Uh, and, you know, there was no question in our minds that the, uh, 
that the NV-109 was, was a formidable airplane. You know, P-51, we were sure it was better, but the you know, NV-109 wasn't anything to sneeze at, nor was the, uh, was the FW-190. The, uh, the ME-262 was, you know, was very fast, and I remember the day that, that we saw that one come through the formation with the P-51s chasing them. I mean, there was, uh, there was, I had never seen anything go so fast as that in my life. Fortunately, it was at the very end of the war. It was, yeah, this was probably in March, March or April. Any time that, did you get time off any R&R? &R? You went to this rest home, you called it. Yeah. Uh, did any USO shows come to you, or did you go to anything like that? We, well, we, we would get a couple of days off. We'd get a two-day pass or a three-day pass to London every few weeks. So uh, that was our our R and R. I mean, you know, we we just get a few days off, and uh, we we didn't have to go to London, but that's usually where our crew went. And you know there was there was nightlife. There was you know bands and there was there was food and stuff like that. So. At any time, did you or uh, your group um, have in support uh, foreign uh, air forces or pilots? No, no. You were just strictly Americans. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Was there? The one outstanding or memorable experience in your whole career that you could tell us about today? Well, a memorable experience, one which I recall fondly, were the uh, food drop missions that we flew over the Netherlands just around VE Day. The, uh, the Germans had uh, practically starved the population to death and they were, they were desperate for food. And there was an agreement with the Germans that, uh, that we would drop food to the Dutch uh, and they wouldn't shoot at us. VE Day hadn't, war hadn't, hadn't ended yet, you see. And uh, so they loaded the, was loaded the B-17s with uh, groceries, you know, you know Packaged, packaged foods, uh, and I think it was a plywood pallet that was put in there. So we flew across the channel, and then we, uh, with the wheels down and the flaps down, uh, and the bomb bay doors open, you know, we were flying at a few hundred feet over the, uh, the Dutch countryside, and uh, then there were designated drop zones where to drop the, the food, and I remember the uh, in flowers they spelled out Dutch kids I guess uh, thanks yanks or boys or something like that and that was that was an eye-watering experience for just about everybody in the, in the you know for for all of us now we flew three of those missions and on one of the missions you know some sore head on the ground German. Uh, you know, they started firing at us, so we were credited with a with a. It didn't do any damages. It didn't do any damage to our plane. I know that, but we were credited with a combat mission on account of that. So, somebody fired at you when you were dropping food. Yeah, great, great. How about a memorable character? The you must have met a lot of interesting people. Is there one outstanding the, one? Well, I, you know, I was very friendly with, uh, with Everett Lundstrom, our co-pilot, and, uh, and you know, he, he, was, he was a big Finnish Swede, uh, and uh, he and I palled around together a lot. You know, we, we, we drank a lot of scotch at the officers' club together. He was a Louis Armstrong fan. He had a, he had a big laugh, and, uh, and then, you know, we, uh, we became friends afterwards and we saw one another you know after the war you know quite a few times so so he was you know probably the uh, the staunchest friend that I that I made so and he liked he, Louis Armstrong and he liked Louis Armstrong the uh, 
We had a classroom instructor in navigation school. His name was John Ball. He was a Pan American uh, guy, and he was he was a strong personality and uh, and was able to put the subject across in lucid, lively manner. It turns out that he he became an author, and in the library, not too many years ago, there was a there was a book. It was called Phase Three Alert. And it was about a B-17 that had crashed. It was a novel that had crashed uh, or landed on Iceland on the ice cap, you no know, Greenland. And then it was found years later on, and they put the thing back together. But the author's name was John Ball, and there was a picture of him with burnt balcon on on the back and so forth. And it was was him. So I wrote him through the publisher, and uh, and reminded him, you know, of. My recollection of him as a you know classroom instructor. Yeah, no, it's the same guy. He wrote wrote back. That's to me, very so. interesting. Very interesting. Where were you when the war ended? I was was in England. Was well the the war ended in uh, in May of forty five. I mean VE Day was was in May. Uh, we went to Ipswich that night, and I think we all got drunk. Uh, I I was at loose ends to see the war end suddenly. I mean, that's not to say that I was sorry to see it end, but uh, by this time the missions were pretty easy, and I could see my way flying through nine more missions, and then going home. Uh, so so now you know the war was ended, uh, and I didn't know what was going to happen next. So in that sense, I was a little bit at loose ends, but then. Uh, those of us who had flown, well, a completed tour was was 35 missions when I was flying. Those of us who had flown 25 or more missions at VE Day were credited with a full tour and declared to be happy warriors, and we got the lucky bastard certificate and all that. But then the uh, the group was destined to be redeployed to the, in the Pacific. So uh, we, were, those of us who were happy warriors, were separated from the air echelon, uh, and the the air echelon, namely the airplanes, and uh, and the crews and the mechanics and so forth, uh, took off for I think in June, took off for the U.S. And uh, so we rattled around. Uh, well, we rattled around the base for a while, and then we were sent to to the western part of England near Blackpool, and uh, <clears throat> waiting for transportation home. Then there was a, a ninth Air Force group that flew A-26s that uh, that was supposed to fly home, and they needed navigators. So uh, a number of us, you know, were dis were attached to that ninth Air Force group. And sent to uh, Valley in Wales, which was the uh, the departure point. So after we got to know those fellows and got to familiarize ourselves with the with the A26, we we took off, and we flew from from Wales to Iceland, and where we spent a week because the weather wasn't any good. Uh, we were supposed to go from Iceland on to Greenland, so uh, Iceland was was dismal. Because because the weather wasn't any good, and you know it was well, it was off in the boondocks. There was no vegetation. There was all this volcanic rock and stuff like that. It was, you know, we we didn't like it there. But uh, then finally, the weather was good in Iceland. The weather was su supposed to be good in Greenland, so we we took off. Now, going to Greenland was was an interesting experience, because we were briefed to uh, if it was visual. We could fly over the ice cap and make our letdown, but if if there was an under undercast, uh, then we were supposed to fly to the mouth of a fjord, and fly up the fjord, and at the third or fourth left turn, we were supposed to turn, and there we would find Bluey West One, which was the field. Well, you know, flying up this fjord at a few hundred miles an hour, counting and making sure that you don't lose count, uh, and then finding a runway where the uh, where it was downwind and uphill landing, you know, that was that was kind of a kind white, of hairy. white knuckles thing too. <laughs> so, so then, 
but Greenland was, was spectacularly beautiful. I mean, we, we were impressed, and and I think cigarettes cost about you know 25 cents a carton or something like that. You know, because there was no no duty or anything like that. And of course, we were all smokers in those days. And after a few days in Greenland, we had to go on to Labrador, to to Goose Bay, and uh, and we landed there on a Saturday, and uh, and then there were. They were going to have a big picnic, so nothing was going to get done for a few more days. So, but we were invited to the picnic, which was very nice. But you know, we were just as soon have started off to go home. So finally, we took off from Labrador and we flew down to, to Bradley Field, and that was all camouflaged. You know, that was hard to find. I mean, the buildings were camouflaged. The runways didn't look. You know, it didn't didn't look like an airbase. Bradley Field. So yeah, yeah. So so that's where we landed. So then I was was home again. So. Okay. When and where were you discharged? Well, then, uh, then we got a 45 day day leave. And it might have been a 30 day leave, which was uh, extended to 45 days, and then I had to report to Greensboro, North Carolina. Which was the separation center. So I, and because I was an officer, I wasn't discharged. I was separated. Uh, in other words, they didn't relinquish their hold on us uh, completely. Do I understand? So, so that was in November of forty-five. Finally, November of forty-five. Yeah. If you had flown fewer than twenty-five missions in Europe, would you have gone to Japan or well, the Pacific? Well, no. Well, I mean, I would. We were destined to go to Japan, to the Pacific, but then you remember in, in August, uh, the war in Japan ended. Mm -hmm. So before the, I mean, the, the group came home and there was probably some more training and one thing or another. Before they could get sent to Japan, the, war had, already, the war had already stopped. So, With what rank uh, and with what decorations did you come home? Oh, well, I, I became a first lieutenant. Oh, after a few months, and I think that was automatic. I mean, if you if you flew and did what you were supposed to, then you, then the promotion was automatic. So I became first lieutenant. For for six missions, we were awarded an air medal. So after flying six missions, uh, I received an air medal, and you know there, there was a ceremony. You know, those of us that uh, were were to be you know decorated, and then for. For subsequent blocks of six missions, we received oak leaf clusters for the air medal. So I have, I have an air an air medal and three oak leaf clusters, because I flew 26. So so that means for the for the 20, I have 24 missions worth of air medals, and then we're working on, and, and on the a next third one. of another one. Uh, yeah, and then and then we have battle stars. I have battle stars for. Uh, the Ardennes campaign, which was the Bulge, and then Rhineland, which I guess was you know Western Germany, and then for uh, for Central Europe. So I have you know I have the theater ribbon and the three battle stars. When you came home, did you join any uh, veterans organizations uh, like the American Legion, something like that? No, no, I I, I signed up to stay in the reserve. But, and I didn't. I didn't do much in that, so I, I left that. I, I belong to the VFW because I have a nephew that served in Vietnam, who was the post commander in Chatham, and he grew up in, in Natick, by the way, and uh, and I think in a in a drive to membership drive or something like that, he persuaded me to to join. So I'm a member of of his post in Chatham, but uh, you know that's within the past, you know. Five or six years that I did that. So, what kind of a reception did you get when you came home from uh, family, friends, community? Warm, warm reception, warm, warm, open arms reception. So, they were they were glad to see the boys home. So, when you came home, uh, did you discuss with your spouse or family or friends what you'd seen and what you'd done in the service? Well, I didn't have a spouse. Uh, How about they, your mom and dad? Well, they knew that I had flown missions over Germany. Uh, and I don't know that there was much discussion about that. The, most of the talk was confined to people that I 
that I had known in the service. I mean, if I, <clears throat> I saw George Waymire a few times because he married a girl from, from near, near where I lived. And we would talk, and I would see Everett Lundstrom, and, uh, and we would talk, but, uh, but there wasn't much occasion to tell, to tell air stories. And we, you know, we weren't at that age very, very, very weren't very introspective, so. How important uh, was serving in the military for you? It was, it was very important to me. Uh, I mean, as I, as I like, look back on it, it was, uh, was a great experience. You know, in large part, it was an adventure. Uh, it, was, it was formative. Uh, some of the things that I, that I learned as a navigator were, were work habits that stood me in good stead you know, later on in my professional life as an engineer. What did you think then, and, and what do you think now, about the war that you were involved in? Well, I think it's a war that, that had to be fought. Uh, I, I realize that those of us that flew in B-17, you know, we're part of a big experiment. Well. I mean, there was this notion that strategic bombing would be efficacious in, in bringing the enemy to his knees. Uh, it's, it's still not altogether clear that that's, that that's so. And we overwhelmed them with our productive capacity. I mean, we sent so damn many airplanes over there and dropped so many bombs that, you know, we, we prevailed. Uh, but it was a costly experiment. I mean, it, it didn't work from day one. You know, we lost an awful lot of airplanes and they had to develop P-51s and, you know, in tactics and everything else. So it was, uh, was, a, was a big effort, big learning experience. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're fortunate that it came out as, as it did. At, you know, I've read books like Eisenhower's Crusade in Europe and stuff like that, and it certainly wasn't in the cards that we were going to win when the war first started. So uh, it's, it's interesting to see how, how the plans were developed and, you know, the whole program took, took shape. Was there any point during the, your service where you had any kind of a change of heart or looked at the war effort differently from the time you did when you joined the service? Well, I, I mean, when I joined the service, I had this, this great notion of seeing an airplane and flying all over the place. And then, you know, then, then I realized that, <laughs> uh, that things are a good deal more serious and heavy than this. But I, you know, I never regretted having, having signed up. I mean, I, you know, I thought I was doing the right thing all the time, doing what was expected of me. Do you feel there was a difference in public opinion uh, regarding the veterans who served in uh, your war, World War II, and those who served in Korea or Vietnam or other conflicts? Yeah, the, the public opinion of those conflicts uh, is, is taken out on the veterans. I mean, the, the Korean War was not popular. Not all of us approved of, of that action. The Vietnam War was even less so. Uh, I think it's unfortunate that uh, a lot of the people take their uh, feelings about the war themselves, the, the, those wars, out on the, on the, the guys that, that went to fight them. I mean, it's, it's unfair for them to, to be tarred with with that brush. We've talked here for um, well over an hour. I wonder if there's any one thought or one incident or one overarching idea that you would like to share with your family or people who will be watching this tape in the future. 
I believe that, that World War II was the defining or pivotal event of the 20th century. And, and I don't mean just the war itself, but the, the pre-war years, uh, you know, the depression that we're in and so forth, and the events that led up to the war. Then the war and the way the country mobilized itself and its resources to prosecute that war and then the end of the war and the, uh, and the, the post-war years and the prosperity that went with that, the ability for those of us you know, that, that did so to continue our educations you know, under, with our GI fellowships and, and, uh, and the rise of suburbs and you know, all of this that, that came about, uh, you know, kind of a fallout from, from the war. So I, th I think the World war Second World War was, as I say, maybe the, the defining event of the 20th century. And, uh, you know, I think, I think that's, that's something that we should think about. Matt, thank you for being with us today. You're, You're welcome. a very articulate spokesman. Thank you. And we appreciate your coming in. Thank okay. you. Okay.